in this slide. Excellent. So, uh, hi everybody. My name is Rob Sherwood. Let's get uh, settled in here. Um, I'm going to be talking today about how to scale out neutron networks. How many people actually have an OpenStack network deployed? Anyone? And of you, how many of you are actually having problems with Neutron? So what I'm going to talk about today is a whole bunch of stuff that hopefully will help you with some of those problems with Neutron. So uh, I am the CTO at Big Switch Networks. We build networking software. But networking software is only one piece of this crazy OpenStack puzzle. So what I'm going to talk about today is a large scale-out testbed that we did with our partners Mirantis on the OpenStack side, as well as Dell, both for the compute and the physical hardware, running the big switch software. And so we scaled that out to 300 nodes running Neutron, and we made it work. And so today I'm going to talk about you know, what that scale-out testbed looked like, what are some of the things we ran into, and some of the fixes that we have. Uh, and I'm last going to end with uh, this thing that I'm going to call our Chaos Monkey Torture Test to convince you that this actually really does work in a production environment. And there are, honestly aren't enough of you that I should be worried about. Like, you should interrupt me and ask me questions. I guess is where I'm going. So just shortly about Big Switch, uh, what we have seen is that there are these really large companies in the, net in the world, so the Microsofts and Googles and Facebooks of the world, who have just stopped using traditional networking vendors. You know, they have started creating their own boxes, their own networking stacks. They've started doing things completely different from how things have always been done. So what Big Switch Networks does as a company is we try to figure out what are these guys doing. And there's some things that they're doing that's actually not all that useful for the rest of the world. But there's actually a good chunk of what they're doing that is useful. And we're trying to figure out how to productize it and to bring it to folks who can't afford to hire 10,000 programmers to run their network. So, all of our products are based off of this one big switch architecture notion. So the idea is if you actually have kind of traditional chassis based switch, you know, something like a, a Nexus 7K or a, a CAT 6500, if you look under the covers, there's actually three components there. And so those components are roughly a supervisor card, you know, something that looks roughly like a PC, uh, a line card, and then a bunch of fabric backplanes that the line cards plug into. And notably, those line cards plug into the backplane using something that's called a, a clause topology. So what Big Switch Networks does is we actually pull that supervisor card out of the, the box. And we'll call that a controller. And we're going to pull those fabric line cards out. And we're going to call those spine switches. And we're going to pull the line cards out and call those leaf switches. And so what we have done here is actually recreated all of the elements of this traditional big switch using commodity, low cost, data center pizza, one new pizza box switches. Um, but the reason why people don't run their networks this way is it's actually a pain in the ass to manage a whole bunch of different switches. And so with this controller, this redundant pair of controllers, you can have a single point of control that manages this big collection of switches, you know, potentially upwards of 40 switches, all like it's one big switch. And this one big switch notion is the core to how are we build our products. And it's actually so fundamental, that's how we named our company Big Switch Networks. D does this make sense so far? Someone say yes so I can move on. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm not going to move on. I've tricked you. Uh, so the thing that we've called this to, to help you remember this vision. So, I claim this is the same thing that happened in the mainframe days when people sold these large vertically integrated mainframes and eventually moved to the data centers that we have today where you have disaggregated uh, hardware, you have individual servers that you actually manage like it's one big large mainframe. And, and it's exactly this same analogy that goes on in the networking world right now. So we've actually started jokingly calling these big older style chassis boxes, we started calling those net frames. Um, just to, to drive home that point a little bit more. So this is the last slide about Big Switch, and I'll get back to OpenStack. But so we have two products. Uh, they're both basically taking large traditional boxes, either a network packet broker uh, or a data center switch, and re-implementing those with one new pizza box data center switches with different smart hardware on top, this uh, smart software on top. 
Um, you know, this software uses SDN control technology, but that's honestly more of an implementation detail. The benefit that you get as a user is that you can actually manage uh, your entire network uh, from a single pane of glass. With our data center switch equivalent, our big cloud fabric, our main use case, not surprising because we're here, is actually OpenStack. So we provide OpenStack plugins to manage our, our network. You know, we have a Neutron plugin. We have some of our developers here on staff today. Um, we also have VMware integration. Uh, and we also integrate with other forms of, of control software that you might use, uh, including Hadoop, uh, Hyper-V, and some other points. But for purposes of today, I'm going to focus on the OpenStack bits. So what happens with Big Cloud Fabric is we'll deploy a collection of switches, leaf and spine, along with, and this is the new thing that we're actually announcing today uh, in Japan, along with our virtual switch as well. So this, the idea is that you will have both the physical switches and the virtual switches under the same control, control from the same redundant pair of controllers. What this means from an OpenStack context is we can actually improve some of the efficiencies, and I'll be talking about this, of things like the L3 agent. We can actually implement things like distributed virtual routing, both across physical switches as well as uh, virtual ones. That means that you can get the equivalent of distributed routing for your virtual workloads as well as your physical workloads and the combination of the two. Uh, we have our own Neutron plugin. It's uh, adapted into the, it's available uh, through the, the OpenStack uh, distribution, uh, and we have integration with folks like Red Hat, Mirantis, uh, and Canonical is soon to come. The, the one thing I really want you to take away from this picture is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, we're the only company that provides this integrated support of the physical and the virtual nodes, um, particularly for OpenStack. So the, that's all, you know, a whole bunch of stuff about the company that don't particularly, doesn't particularly apply to the fun part of the talk. So the fun part of the talk is talking about how we, uh, in partnership with Dell and Mirantis, actually built a huge test bed. So we threw roughly about a million dollars of the hardware at this problem to figure out you know, what are really the scaling limits for Neutron. So we threw uh, 300 compute nodes uh, donated by Dell Networks, uh, along with a whole bunch of uh, switches, uh, as you can see here. Uh, net, you know, just south of uh, five terabytes of, of data, you know, uh, 140 terabytes of disk. This is actually a pretty sizable cluster. Um, this was based off of uh, Dell uh, R22 uh, devices. We actually used Fuel as the installer. Uh, we ran with five OpenStack control nodes uh, and two redundant Big Cloud Fabric uh, control cluster nodes. Any questions so far? If nobody asks any questions, I'm going to get through this talk really fast. So this actually used the full Neutron plugin. Uh, so because we have control of both the physical, and so the question was, was with the, this with the ML2 plugin. So because we have control of the physical nodes and the virtual nodes, we actually don't need the ML2 split. Um, this is correct, right? We've got our developers in the audience here, so. Yeah. I, I assume what Rajneesh was clarifying is we actually have a mode where we actually, you, our, using our vSwitch is optional. And so if you actually want to use just the physical fabric, we do have an ML2 plugin for that. But specific to this deployment, this is the, the full Neutron plugin. Um, this is a, a shot from our controller dashboard. Um, so we used uh, 16 leaf switches. So I'm sorry, 18 leaf switches. So this was nine racks with re redundant leafs in each rack uh, and four spine switches. Um, we created, uh, in our parlance, uh, a tenant is an OpenStack project. So 250-some projects um, and uh, over almost 900 endpoints. So you know, the, th this is kind of the, the money slide. This is the, the problems that we ran into and, and how we got them fixed. So one of the first problems, and I think most people know this, your L3 agent can be scheduled somewhat arbitrarily through the fabric. And so if you have two nodes that are in different networks, 
that are trying to talk to each other, they may have to go someplace completely different to route through an L3 agent before they can talk to each other, even if they're actually even co-located on the same device. So if you have VMA in one network and VMB in another network and they're connected by a logical router, in traditional, net in traditional OpenStack networking, that L3 agent actually could be somewhere else and you might have a hairpinning that, that happens. The, the thing that's particularly bad about hair pinning, you know, maybe you can over-provision and maybe you can have lots and lots of these L3 agents, um, but it also causes these weird correlated air conditions. So if a rack that's not involved with the compute nodes goes down, maybe it takes your L3 agent with you and then you have the, these weird issues that happen there. Uh, another thing that people tend to do with Neutron is say, all right, well, if I have you know, a bottleneck in my L3 agents, let me actually just make lots of L3 agents. And so kind of the, the extreme of that is to have an L3 agent per compute node. And so as you approach an L3 agent per compute node, you actually have uh, a whole bunch of scaling challenges that happen. So the first thing that happens is all the L3 agents have a keep alive protocol that runs. And that keep alive protocol doesn't scale once you get up to the order of 300 nodes. And as a result, um, L3 agents start spuriously timing out. And when they time out, the OpenStack scheduler thinks they've died, so it tries to reschedule them. And the rescheduling process is itself actually fairly heavy. And so what ends up happening is not only do you have these L3 agents kind of disappearing for no good reason and coming back, it actually causes uh, excessive load on your system as they churn and get moved around. So. So the, the question was, does our, our Switchlight VX um, actually run in uh, user space or kernel space, and is it a replacement for OBS? And the answer uh, is actually yes and no. So we actually replace the user space part, leaving the OBS kernel space. So what we found is talking to uh, a large swath of customers, many people are worried about putting weird stuff in their kernel. And I, I certainly understand that, and that makes sense. So they really want a kernel, that, uh, a kernel module that's been blessed by the kernel.org folks. So we decided to keep using the OVS kernel agent, but we've actually replaced it with our own user space agent. And so built into that user space agent is a bunch of the NAT functionality, the L3 routing functionality, the DHCP functionality, and a couple other things. Do, does that make sense? I apologize, sir. I can't hear you. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So, um, and, and Rajneesh, feel free to, to jump in here as well. So what's interesting with our solution, because we have the physical and the virtual, the OpenStack DVR is not DVR for physical. It's only for the virtual. And so this way, we can actually integrate with the, the physical bare metal workloads because we can implement the DVR equivalent functionality in the physical switches as well. D anything you want to add to that? Or? Okay. Turns out I got it right. This is the downside of being CTO. Like, you're supposed to know this stuff, but these are the guys who write all the code. <laughs> um, so you know, these are the two problems we ran into as you start to scale out uh, to 300 nodes. And you know, a a as folks have guessed, you know, it turns out our, our virtual switch does actually solve these problems. So first, you know, we implement the distributed virtual routing and the NAT uh, per compute node. So that guarantees that between any two points, you'll never do hair pinning. You'll always follow the shortest path. And also it means that if you have some sort of uh, resiliency issue, maybe a rack goes away, only the nodes in that rack are affected. There's no, uh, not necessarily a, a cross-correlation problem. Uh, the other thing it turns out is you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do scale-out monitoring of lots of switches and lots of nodes. So we actually, using our open flow controller uh, and the SDN primitives that we've learned, we actually avoid all of the, the keep alive storm type issues and there's no need to start rescheduling all of these L3 agents all over the place. Does that make sense? That, that's kind of a mouthful, but I actually don't even have a lot of time. So. <laughs> yes, um, so not pictured here, uh, but we do implement service chaining. Uh, we don't implement it with tagging or tunneling. We actually do something that looks a lot like smart routing. So you can think of it as um, between two points, by policy, you can implement a service chain by saying, as the device crosses the logical router, we will actually change the MAC addresses 
and the, the output direction to go to the service, but we actually don't change the, um, the packet header. And what the, the magic is, after something has been processed by the service, it comes back, hits the same logical router, and we, by the interface it comes in, can say, OK, we, now that's actually been processed by the service, now go on to the destination. Does, does that make sense? And much like the, the, the DVR functionality, uh, what's cool about our solution, and I think unique about our solution, is we do that not just for the virtual workloads, but also the physical. And so at least it's been my experience that there are a bunch of pure virtual workloads, but most workloads are somewhat virtual and some physical. You get things where people want to talk to a storage node or a fire, like a hardware firewall or something like that. And whether that changes over time or not, I think we're all hoping it does, but you know, Ironic is a real project. You know, Magnum with the, the bare metal uh, containers, those are, are real projects. And it'll be interesting to see how this evolves over time. But my claim is that you know, most customers have some combination of physical and virtual workloads. And so this is a valuable thing. The point I want to make here is actually a, a, a really interesting one. Doing scale in the steady state, where you're just trying to make sure that things stay up, that's actually kind of the easy problem. What, we'd, what we've done here is uh, a test that we call the Chaos Monkey test, a little bit similar to what Netflix has done, where we took the uh, Hadoop Terrasort benchmark and ran it on a stable network, and it came out with some number. It ran in 7 minutes, 20-ish seconds. Um, and then we ran that benchmark again and did horrible things to the network. So we killed the active controller every 30 seconds. We killed the random switch every eight seconds, and we killed the random link every four seconds, um, being careful not to cause a disconnection. And so, A, if this ever happened to your network, it would be horrible. But what happens in this network, because we have multipathing everywhere, because we pre-program uh, pre all the backup routes, there was effectively almost no discernible change to the performance numbers. It still ran in seven minutes, 20-ish seconds, give or take. So. The, the lesson to take from this is even if there's horrible things going on in your network, as long as you have this style of SDN control, you can actually recover so quickly that your application barely notices. So, and we did this at scale as well. So, I mean, again, this is a, it's easy to put up a 300-node uh, test network uh, that, that runs in a steady state, but as it starts recovering from this scale of link failures, this scale of switch failures, that's really where the, the rubber hits the road. Questions on this? Um, if anything I've said to you is interesting so far today, uh, we actually have both of our products, uh, both the, the big cloud fabric that I talked about today and the big monitoring fabric that I only briefly mentioned. That they're available online uh, with a free trial. So if you just log into labs.bigswitch.com, uh, you can find out more about these products. Um, but you know, in conclusion, you know, I, I feel like we, we did something that I don't know that many other people have done. We really scaled out Nova to, to 300 nodes. Um, and actually, I should say, 300 nodes wasn't the limit of the software. That was actually the limit of the hardware that we could throw at it. Presumably, it scales out even larger than that. Um, and I, one of the other things that we did is you know, scaling the steady state is relatively easy. But with this chaos monkey testing that we did, I think that we, we showed that it actually scales out in a real production uh, bulletproof kind of way. Um, there's a bunch of details that I haven't had a chance to get into uh, here in the talk. Feel free to grab me or some of my colleagues. There's a couple of us around uh, afterwards. Or, or we've got the, the white papers online. And uh, with that, uh, I thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any further questions that you guys have. Thank you. Sorry, a lot of background noise. Do you know the answer to that, Rajneesh? I don't. Uh, so the DVR, as far as I know, is actually a relatively new thing. So this was with Juno. OK. Yeah. Sorry, for those who are missing this, the, the, the other point is the 
the existing Kilo DVR implementation, I think, doesn't uh, do high, fail high availability failover of the floating IP state. So if you lose a DVR instance, you actually lose the, um, the state for the, the NAT transactions. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. All right. Thank you, everyone.